Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Interrogating 3D Spheroid versus 2D Monolayer Cell Models in Drug Discovery Using Cell Health Microplate Assays. I am Michelle Ashton of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit www.thermofisher.com. Let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want and any time you want during this presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab down at the top right of the presentation window. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Adiari Fayarero, Senior Scientist at Thermo Fisher Scientific, and Dr. Leticia Montoya, Scientist, Cell Biology at Thermo Fisher Scientific. For a complete biography on our speakers, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Our speakers will now begin their presentation. Well, thank you so much, Michelle, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Adyari Ferrero, and, and uh, along with my colleague, my colleague uh, Leticia Montoya, we are going to be um, presenting today um, uh, a number of results that will reveal to you uh, what are the main critical points that you have to be taking into account when, when you are transitioning between uh, 2D and 3D cellular models and especially when you are utilizing uh, cell health uh, microplate assay. So we are going to focus today in um, trying to reveal to you what are the critical points that you should uh, be taking into account. Um, the presentation will be divided into two, two parts. So uh, during the first part of the presentation, I will be discussing with you guys um, several key issues that has to be taken into account when performing this kind of side-by-side -side comparison and simply when, when moving from one cellular system to, to, to the other one between 2D and 3D systems. And I'm going to give you an overview of all the available products and, and instruments that uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific has at your disposal uh, to facilitate this, this transitioning. And then we are going to focus on some of these uh, theoretical aspects that are really important to be able to interrogate um, uh, cellular health in 3D. So what are the critical issues? What, uh, what would be important to measure? How such measurements should be performed, especially when utilizing microplate readers? And then my colleague uh, Leticia will, will go over to uh, three different cases of uh, cell health assays that uh, have been developed originally uh, for 2D cellular systems in by Thermo Fisher Scientific. But we are hoping now that we can demonstrate to you guys how those um, systems can be utilized also uh, on 3D. We are going to show you results that will illustrate both endpoint and kinetic assays. And then but last but not least, we are going to um, give you some ideas and, and really showcase how this quantitative approach utilizing microbiote readers can be really very well uh, correlated with the results that can be obtained with high content, high content imaging. Hopefully, after this hour of discussing uh, with you guys and, and giving, giving you uh, our thoughts, then you will be able to learn some important messages and be able to really take those messages and facilitate your work uh, in the future. So uh, I'd like to start today by um, going over to something that is probably quite familiar for you all. Um, and it relates to the pipeline uh, of drug discovery. Um, we, we all know that uh, the, the, the pipeline of drug discovery is characterized by a quite uh, strong emphasis on throughput at the very early stages of the drug discovery process. At the very early stages of the drug discovery process, uh, scientists are interested in really generating a, a large amount of um, uh, promising leads that can be then further developed into uh, promising drug candidates. So for these uh, hydroput uh, analyses at the very early stages, uh, we, we have traditionally utilized uh, in vitro assays and that has been routinely performed uh, in 2D. And the reason why they have been performed in 2D is because such models are 
extremely uh, user friendly from the perspective of of the throughput. So it's they are very simple models and they are uh, very easily uh, adaptable to high throughput screening uh, conditions. However, the main uh, detriment or the main drawback of such model is that they are really restricted simplicity and the fact that they often lack on um, predictive capacity. So in an attempt to really um, improve this uh, quality of the in vitro screens that are performed at the early stage of the drug discovery process. So this has been a progressive shift towards uh, the utilization of 3D cellular systems. And this is perhaps a good moment for, you guys, for, for us to clarify that uh, often in the literature we talk about 2D and 3D, but we are in both cases talking about cells and they, of course, they, they are all in 3D, they exist at, as, uh, in 3D. But when we talk about 2D, we talk about uh, adherent or suspended cells, and, and they are dramatically different from the cells that are growing in a more uh, geometrically structured uh, shape uh, that we will uh, shortly discuss afterwards. For the purpose of this presentation, every time that we talk about 2D, we refer to monolayers, cellular monolayers, and every time that we talk about 3D, we are uh, focusing on, on spheroids. So really the fact that with, with spheroids we can still maintain a very high throughput while gaining a valuable complexity, it's really what has prompted an explosion of 3D studies. Um, you can see at the moment more, quite close to 1,000 peer review publications published every year on the topic of 3D. And, um, and well, this is the reason why we are discussing today about 3D. We are trying to aid this transition. We are trying to help you guys um, using new tools that can be utilized for this transition. So the question that I want to tackle now at the moment, uh, next is why do we believe that these 3D systems are actually better models? Why do we believe that this added complexity actually increases the predictability value of those uh, systems? And, um, and really the, the main feature that it's very um, relevant to indicate for, uh, for steroids in general for 3D models is that they really are better pharmacological models and there's been an increasing amount of evidence showing, showing that you get much better uh, pharmacological predicti predictability with these 3D cells. The, the, the main reason behind that is simply that uh, when 3D uh, cells are formed, when, when spheroids are formed, you, you end up with an ecosystem of cells that are interacting with each other in such a way that really resembles much better what happens in vivo, especially in the case of solid tumors. So um, 3D cells, and especially spheroids, have become um, much better and much more advantageous models uh, for pharmacolo pharmacological prediction of drugs uh, in solid tumors. They are better models of in vivo hypoxia. They are better models also of this in vivo heterogeneity that is typical of tumors. And you can really uh, study the effect of drugs in a much more valuable way, a much more meaningful way that we could uh, in the traditional 2D monolayers that have been utilized uh, in drug discovery. And uh, so as, as we move from 2D to 3D, we, we often encounter scientists that are uh, developing new 3D systems, but when developing these new 3D systems, they, they are often in this, um, in, this, in this situation that they need to utilize or they need to interrogate cellular health functions, and they are unable to find the tools that can be utilized simultaneously in 2D and 3D models. Um, the truth is, as you can uh, see in this comparison table, that uh, the majority of the commercial and even um, uh, in-house, let's say, workflows that exist Currently, they are built around 2D cultures, and scientists are, are uh, faced with the situation that they, they just don't have enough tools, um, especially commercial tools, that can be utilized readily uh, from 2D to 3D. So, so this is a situation that we are trying to tackle and that we are trying to address here as time official scientific. So our uh, R&D scientists are trying really to validate better tools and we are trying to really address the, 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 the lack of these uh, validated essays. So this is precisely what we are going to try to illustrate to you guys today. We are going to start with the current um, portfolio of products that we have to support 3D cellular models. I, I must mention also at this stage that we are not going to discuss today uh, anything related to how 3D cell cultures are uh, grown and how they are formed. 
Um, we are only focusing on how to interrogate 3D cellular functions once these 3D cells uh, or 3D cell, cell systems have been developed. But it's good for you guys to, to be aware that we offer a very broad portfolio of products that includes cells, that also includes uh, matrices and cell culture vessels. And, and especially in the case of uh, scaffold-free uh, 3D systems, uh, Thermo Fisher has developed um, uh, the Sphera uh, portfolio of products that covers a, a number of different um, cell culture um, dishes and cell culture vessels that, are all, that have ultra low attachment surface. And this is precisely this Sphera microblades are the ones that we are going to be showing today in, in our results. We also have a number of media and supplements that can be utilized for, for growing cells in 3D. And last but not least, we have a number of instruments and uh, essays and reagents that can be utilized to study um, cellular functions in 3D. And those are the ones that we are going to be focusing uh, on the presentation today. But as I said, we are here to help you. So um, if you have any questions about any of these products that you, you have seen here in this presentation, please reach out to us. And if we cannot answer the question right away, then we will be happy to put you in contact with one of our specialists. So when we talk about approaches that have been utilized to study 3D, once uh, it's it's very very often the case that we see um, we see researchers researchers utilizing uh, high content imaging and fluorescent imaging. Those have been traditionally used uh, for exploring 3D um, 3D morphology for studying 3D phenotypic changes. But now, more and more, we also see scientists interested in exploring um, cellular function and quantifying cellular function using micro readers. This is actually a logical approach. We feel that it's, it's, it would, it, for scientists, uh, micro readers are nearly in every lab, in every life science lab. So it is, it's a very, um, very useful shift to, to be able to continue using uh, imaging, but also being able to progressively adapt more and more cellular essays that are so widely available for 2D models into the uh, 3D uh, models space. So today we are going to focus on uh, quantification of cellular function using microplate readers. And the, the microplate reader that is our hero today, it's the uh, Thermo Scientific Body Scan Lux Multi-Mode Microplate Reader, which was launched in 2015. And it is really a multi-technology instrument that can be used for measuring optical signals in basically any kind of microplate format from 6 to 1536 of well plate. We are shortly going to be uh, going over these uh, detection technologies, but I want to point out that uh, Variscan Lux is a microblade reader that allows you to perform essays uh, in endpoint and kinetic mode, which we will be covering today. But we can also, or you can also perform experiments in spectral, multipoint, and kinetic spectral mode. Uh, these are typically available mode for all of, all of, all of the microplate readers that are available in the market. So even though I will be referring often to Bariscan Lux um, multi-mode reader today, um, most of the theoretical assumptions that we are going to be discussing and most of these theoretical critical points that you have to be aware of, they would also be applicable to all the multi-mode uh, microplate readers. And last but not least, uh, one important feature that I want to bring to your attention uh, when, it, when it comes about uh, Bariscan Lux is that um, Bariscan Lux is operated with a free software. Uh, it's called Scanit software. And within Scanit software, every user has access to an extensive uh, protocol library, the Scanit Cloud Protocol Library, which currently contains over 130 sessions. And some of the assets that we will dis be discussing today are included in this uh, protocol library. Every single protocol library, uh, every single protocol essay in the library has uh, real data with real results, with real uh, data analysis, and it's not really curated data. So our sci scientists make the same mistakes that, that uh, users do, that, that scientists do. So we, we, we have wanted to keep it as authentic and genuine as, as we possibly can. So you will find their real uh, representative data, and, and you will be able to really uh, analyze that data and and uh, explore that, that data to learn about the usage of our instruments and our software. So, um, so now I, I, I said that we will now talk a little bit about the technologies that can be read with microplate readers. This is something very broadly uh, presented, even though I'm referring to body scan locks. So the majority of the multi-mode readers that are uh, available for scientists, they are able to 
measured uh, optical signals that are mostly absorbance, uh, fluorescence, and luminescence. Body scan logs can also measure uh, a special type of fluorescence that is called time resolved fluorescence, or TRF. And we can also measure another special uh, technology that, uh, that is uh, called uh, alpha screen. Today, we are going to be uh, focusing on the two most widely used technologies, or at least two of the most widely used technologies, and that is uh, absorbance and uh, fluorescent measurement. And when we talk about these um, two different detection technologies, it is very, very common the case that uh, scientists really uh, get worried about the possible differences in the detection uh, between 2D and 3D uh, cellular models, and they often get um, intrigued about the fact that they don't know how to select which is the best possible um, measurement mode that they could utilize with their samples. So we are going to try to briefly touch upon the critical things that have to be uh, taken into account when performing either absorbance or uh, fluorescence uh, intensity measurements. I'll start with a very simple comparison between absorbance, or that is also called photometry, and fluorescence measurements. And bear with me, I know that many of you are familiar with these technologies. I just want to give you a very brief overview so that you can understand why this the way, in the, te that the way that the technology works really influences the way that the, our instruments are designed, and in general, most microwave readers are designed. So when we talk about photometric measurements or absorbance measurements, we, men we, we are interested in measuring uh, absorption of light. So um, to be able to measure absorption of light, samples need to be illuminated at a very specific wavelength where they have the, the maximum of absorbance. And the instrument simply record or measure the light intensity that comes out of the sample. So for the purpose of, of performing um, absorbance measurement, we have a wavelength separation step that happens before the, the, the sample is illuminated. And then we, we are recording all the light that goes through the sample. So in, in most microblade readers that are able to measure for, uh, photometry, you always have uh, a detector and, and a lamp that are located in opposite uh, sides of the plate. In the case of Variscan Lux, we are illuminating the samples from the top and then measuring from the bottom of the plate. But the sample has to be illuminated all the way through to be able to measure uh, uh, absorbance or to be able to record uh, photometric measurements. This is a slightly different situation in fluorescence. In fluorescence, um, compounds are also illuminated or samples are uh, also illuminated at a very specific wavelength, the same way that we do in, in absorbance measurements. But in the case of fluorescence measurements, as you are aware, um, the molecules that are uh, having fluorescent properties, they go into a, an excited state. And, and after that excited state, there is a return to, the, return to the ground state that is coupled with the emission of light. And that emission of light happens at a very specific uh, wavelength. So in the case of the recording of fluorescence or the detection of fluorescence with microwave readers, there is all, always a wavelength separation that happens before the light uh, uh, hits the sample, before the, the sample is illuminated, and then after the sample uh, it's illuminated so that you are able to record the specific emitted signal that, um, that takes place at that specific excitation light. Most of the microradiators that are out there can do that in two different ways. They can record the fluorescence that is um, generated from the top of the plate, and they can also record the fluorescence that is generated from the bottom of the plate. And, and this makes uh, a kind of a big distinction on the way that we can also uh, measure 2D versus 3D. So what is critical to consider in the case of uh, absorbance when comparing 2D versus 3D? So I already mentioned that um, absorbance measurements are always performed through the well. And when microwave readers uh, detect um, the, light, the intensity of the light that comes out of the sample, they really cannot make a distinction in the, uh, on the nature of the absorption process that took place on the sample. And what we know is that really the decrease on the light intensity that we measured with microplate readers can be caused mostly by the light absorbance that is on the sample, but it also can happen due to the light scattering of the sample. And that is that samples can really deviate uh, the angle into which the, the light is actually illuminating the sample. So as said, we cannot discriminate, microwave spectrophotometers cannot discriminate between these uh, two processes, and they are really different processes. As you can see in this uh, scheme that is um, here located in the right part of the, of the slide, um, during, the, during the scattering process, uh, particles that are on the sample are really um, 
scattering light. They are uh, deviating the path of the light. And because of, because of this uh, nature of this process, because of the fact that they are deviating the, the path of the light, then this scattering process is strongly dependent on the distance that exists between the sample and the detector. So if we go back to, the, to this scheme to the left, where you, you see the, the differences between 2D and 3D, it can now become a little bit more obvious for you guys that if we are comparing 2D versus 3D, you are going to have a different contribu contribution of the scattering process um, in 2D versus 3D, because the distance that exists uh, between the sample and the detector will be different in the case of 2D versus 3D. So an important consideration that you have to make when performing absorbance measurements in, absorbance measuring, measurements in 2D versus 3D is that you have to include controls without the dice that can be utilized to exclude this uh, scattering process. And really, if you see biggest, really big differences um, taking place in 2D versus 3D, scattering might be one of the reasons as to why this will play out. We know with various scan locks that the distances still between uh, detector and sample are pretty small, and, and very small uh, scattering angles will not have an impact. They will still be detected by the detector. So we know that uh, in, our, in, in our instrument, in Barrios and Locks, this, this is having still a minimal impact. But if you are using all, all kinds of microwave readers, this is definitely one aspect that has to be taken into account when performing uh, absorbance uh, measurements readout. So then in the case of fluorescent intensity measurements, fluorescent intensity measurements, as we discussed uh, uh, some, some minutes ago, they can be performed typically in two different ways. They can be performed uh, uh, from the top or they can be performed from the, from the bottom. In the case of the top readout, um, these top fluorescent measurements are ideally suited, suited to, to measure cell-free systems, otherwise called as biochemical assays. You can see here in, the, in this um, first um, scheme that the, the optical path of various scan locks, which is kind of um, um, shown here with these uh, lines and dotted lines, it, it always has this double conical shape. And in the case of various scan locks, the focal point has been designed in such a way that it, it, it hits the sample right in the middle of the solution. So when you're measuring samples that are um, almost with, that that have fluorescent homogeneously distributed on the well, then this is an idea uh, optical design that will allow allow you to excite and measure the the most of the emitted signal from the middle of the well. The situation is slightly different when we talk about bottom reading well, so bottom reading measurements. Bottom reading measurements are generally ideal for 2D cells, especially if the fluorescence is generated inside of the cells. And that is because in the case of bottom reading, and then again, I'm referring to various scan locks, but it's a situation that is very similar about between different uh, manufacturers. So then in that case, the optical beam uh, has a focal point that is exactly on the bottom of the well. So exactly in the place where uh, 2D cells are um, adhering and where the, most of the fluorescence will be located in, in, in the case of uh, cell-based assays. So when comparing top reading and bottom reading, it is very generally assumed that uh, top reading is ideal for cell-free assays or biochemical assays, and then bottom reading is ideal for 2D cells or, uh, or, or monolayers, cellular monolayers. But then what happens with 3D cells is that we, with 3D cells, we fall into this kind of intermediate situation. We have still cells, and the, the, the fluorescence is um, often restricted to the vicinity of the cells, where the fluorescent probe is actually um, in. But we also have um, cells that are in solution, that are, in the case of spheroids, that they are sort of um, floating in the middle of the, of the well. So what to use in that case? It's clearly that bottom reading might not be ideal in that situation, but would top reading then be sufficient to measure the fluorescence associated to this um, spheroids, to this ge geometrical structure? Well, the answer to that question, or what we have found out in our studies, is that uh, top fluorescence can be sufficient for a 3D cells, but it clearly depends on the assay. And this probably needs to be optimized for uh, every single assay. So if your microwave reader has top and bottom reading, so a very recommended thing to do is that you would compare the performance between top and bottom reading. We also have found out that uh, when using multi-mode microblade readers, it is 
often recommended that uh, one would utilize uh, selectable excitation bandwidth. Typically, microblade readers have the possibility to switch between different excitation bandwidths, and by switching between different excitation bandwidths, you would actually have, would increase the beam diameter and would therefore increase the uh, volume that is illuminated and excited uh, on, the, on the sample. So here you see an, the, what actually happens. This is an, a schematic representation, but you get uh, the point that when you are switching between uh, 5 nanometers to 12 nanometers, in the case of virus and lock, you can dramatically increase. In, in this case, it, it actually increases from um, 0 0.7 millimeters to 2 millimeters. So it, it, it really dramatic, it's dramatically increases the excited cellular volume, and therefore it increases the likelihood that you will be able to excite the cells that are located within the spheroid. So a second recommendation for you guys is that if you are able to utilize um, top fluorescence, uh, then it would be recommended to use uh, longer, ex um, a higher excitation bandwidth so that you can uh, excite uh, uh, a larger amount of the cellular volume. At this point, I want to also make a clarification because this is also a question that is often asked to us that it is true that by increasing the excitation bandwidth um, using top optics, you will also uh, end up in often, you will also uh, end up increasing the, um, the background fluorescence. But hopefully this is something that can be uh, taken care of and often the increase in the background signal will not be so high that it would affect the measurement. So you will still uh, be gaining higher signal by increasing the uh, excitation bandwidth. But we come also across these kind of situations when, when scientists are comparing 2D versus 3D, and, and it's, it's often the case that they are bound to use bottom fluorescence because it's simply optimal for the cell health assay that they have chosen. And in, if that is the case, then you have to be aware that there are differences on the way that bottom fluorescence is measured in 2D versus 3D. So uh, when using 2D uh, systems, 2D cellular systems, it is typically the case that cells are grown in flat bottom plates. And when bottom fluorescence is uh, selected in multi-mode readers, and in particular in virus scan locks, so uh, scientists tend to select these um, measurements using multi-point. So me the measurements are performed in different uh, locations on the bottom of the well, and, and you can see as you can, um, uh, as you can visualize in this slide, you can get very nice um, heat maps of the cellular distribution on the bottom of the well. However, if you choose to utilize this kind of multi-point measurements for um, uh, bottom fluorescent readouts in 2D cells, you have to be aware that such type of measurements are not possible to perform with 3D cells, simply because if you are using a scaffold-free system as the one that we are utilizing, uh, the sphera microblades, they are shaped, uh, they have U-shaped uh, u bottom, And in, that, in those cases, it's not really possible to, 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 to have an even uh, illumination of the, of the well bottom. So only the center point location can be measured in those cases. That can result in very different signals. So it's, it would be recommendable in that case to compare only uh, the bottom points in both 2D versus 3D. Here we have an example of what kind of impact this can actually have. This comes from our own results, and, and you can see here the measurement performed in 2D versus 3D with a, with a, um, with a dye that um, binds um, to the living cells on the bottom of the well. And what, what the impact that we can see in this case is that the signal that is recorded in 3D is higher than the signal that is recorded in 2D. And it's not really because there would be a higher amount of cells that are living on the 3D system. It's simply because the background that is measured when using multi-points across the entire bottom of the well is higher than the one that is measured only on the, on the middle of the well in the case of the spheroids. So please be aware that when you are comparing 2D versus 3D, 3D it is really important to select comparable uh, patterns in the case of bottom reading, so that if you are bound to use bottom reading, then be, be sure that, that you are comparing same kind of uh, uh, areas, same kind of excited volumes um, in 2D versus 3D. Otherwise, your results are going to be impacted by this. So um, now we've got to all of the most important theoretical aspects that need to be taken into account when it comes to microblade reading. And I will, um, I will continue by introducing the um, cell health essays that uh, we are going to be discussing uh, today. So um, you are also very familiar with this uh, sort of a scheme that is presented here. 
uh, as cells are, are, are moving from a viable to a non-viable state, they go through a number of uh, different uh, morphological and functional changes. And uh, we know that in pre little cells, for example, cells uh, have an altered metabolism. They also have uh, deregulated uh, cellular proliferation, very low ATP values. And all of these uh, functional changes can be actually followed with a number of different uh, cell, cell health assays. When they, they continue to, to, to die and move to a, a, a non viable state, then, then, as you can see also on the scheme, then other um, cellular events uh, kicked in. For example, then we have um, um, membrane per permeability changes and we have apoptosis proteins being released and then apoptosis events being triggered. And also for those changes, um, uh, we have, there has been a number of cell health assays that has been developed. In our presentation today, we are going to focus on three cellular assays that are targeting um, metabolic studies, metabolic changes, cellular metabolic changes, and uh, DNA content. Um, you can see here that we are going to be talking about Cyquant XTC, Presto Blue HS, which are both uh, cellular redox uh, dye. And then uh, we are going to be talking about the very specific dye that is used for quantification of DNA content, Cyquant Direct. And, um, and then before I go, I want to also introduce you guys to the cellular model that we're going to be discussing today. So the cellular model that we're going to be talking about is the um, A549 lung spheroid model. It's a high throughput, I would say low complexity model. Um, we, we, are using, um, we are using it because it's really an excellent model. It has been extensively used for non-small non cell uh, lung cancer model, especially uh, for the adenocarcinoma type. And it's really easy to set up uh, when starting to perform um, 3D studies. We have, uh, as I already mentioned, grown these cells um, in ultra low attachment plates, spherical plates. And we have, we have followed the changes that take place uh, over a number of hours. The majority of the assays that we, have, um, we are presenting today, they have, been, uh, they have been performed over 20 hours of uh, spheroid growth. And um, those spheroids have been treated uh, throughout the presentation with a modern cytotoxic compound. It's a com compound uh, known as uh, gambosic acid. It's not a drug, but it's a, a highly cytotoxic compound. And the reason why we have uh, chosen to utilize this compound is simply because it is a very, very pleiotropic compound. So it has a very many pleiotropic effects. So it affects so many of uh, different cellular functions that it's, it's really an excellent chemical probe and an excellent chemical tool to be able to study the impact and to be able to interrogate the different cellular functions uh, in 3D. I want to show you now what it looks like when we have performed this uh, kinetic imaging of this um, A549 uh, spheroid. So we have visualized them uh, using different kinds of instruments. We have utilized um, uh, the EVOS M7000 imaging system, and we have also utilized our um, thermal scientific uh, imaging platform, the Cell Inside CX7 um, imaging platform. And you are going to be uh, soon watching uh, a video that shows how cells over time uh, structure and become over and over more compact as time progresses. So it has been described that this is how actually steroids get uh, assembled. But I think it's very revealing when you actually have the opportunity to follow over time this these changes that take place. And, and we are going to show you uh, um, uh, quickly now uh, this video. I just want you to bear in mind that as these cells become more and more compact, they also become more resilient. They also become more chemotolerant to different kinds of treatment. And this is something that uh, we can see from a, from a, a, a quantitative point of view. Uh, Leticia is going to be talking uh, over those points now, but you can also see it very nicely uh, how they become so compact over time with this imaging system. And now you're going to see basically the results that you can, uh, the images that you can obtain uh, over a period of 48 hours with the Cell Inside CX7 uh, imaging platform.
Uh, and now from this point forward, I leave the floor to my colleague, uh, Leticia Montoya, so that she will continue to, um, to walk you through these uh, different examples of cell health essays that, uh, that we presented earlier today. Thank you, Ariane, for that introduction. Um, now that we have talked about the importance of 3D models and the technology used to study 3D models, we will now talk about how several existing reagents that are established for 2D models um, can be used for studying 3D models. Now, Cyclon XCT is an established 2D model photometric cell viability assay that is solution-based. There are two components to this assay. XCT, which is a redox dye, and PMS, which is an electron acceptor that enhances the reduction of XCT. So this assay is an add and read assay, which means you can mix the two components together and then add the mixture to your treated or untreated cells and incubate for four hours at 37 degrees. After the incubation, you measure the absorbance at 450 and 660 nanometers. Now the greater your absorbance value and your absorbance response over time, the more viable cells you have. As I already mentioned before, because this is a photometric measurement on the VarioScan Lux microplate reader, the detection method is through the well, meaning that both your 2D and 3D model systems can be analyzed the same way on the VarioScan Lux microplate reader with the Cyclon XCT reagent. Here we have a drug dose response comparison of monolayer or 2D model systems and spheroids or 3D model systems. With this experiment, monolayer cells or spheroids were plated for 19 hours to allow the cells to adhere to the bottom of the well and to allow for a tight spheroid formation. Both of these models were then treated with gambogic acid and cell viability was assessed with Cyclon XCT at different hours of drug incubation time. So we looked at either two hours, 19 hours, or 48 hours of drug uh, treatment. As shown within these graphs, as the incubation time increases with gambogic acid, the drug becomes more potent. Additionally, when comparing spheroids and monolayers of cells, gambogic acid is less potent to spheroids than to monolayer hours, monolayers of cells. So within this experiment, Cyclon XCT was incubated on the cells for four hours to establish a strong absorbance readout. And we can see the graphs here on the left, you have monolayer, and on the right, you have spheroids. So here's a summary of the IC50 values obtained from the Cyclon XCT analysis with the drug treatment of monolayer or spheroid cellular models. As I mentioned earlier, Higher concentrations of gambogic acid are required to kill the 19-hour spheroids when compared to monolayer cells or to the cellular structures um, or cultures. So this is because of the complexity of the 3D model. Um, more of the drug is required to penetrate the core of the complex structure. Now this is an example of the Cyclon XCT as an endpoint assay, um, taking a read after four hours of incubation with Cyclon XCT. So next we'll talk about using the Cyclon XCT assay in uh, kinetic mode. So as a kinetic assay, the reduction rate of the Cyclon XCT reagent was monitored over time. Here we have untreated monolayer cells or drug-treated monolayer cells. With the untreated monolayer cells, which is the blue line, the absorbance signal increases over time and eventually plateaus at about five hours. This plateau is because all the viable cells have been measured with the Cyclon XCT reagent. Furthermore, if you look at the drug treatment cells or the dead cells, which is the yellow line, the absorbance signal continues to increase over time, but slowly. This is why it's important to record the background signal and the signal that comes from your media only when treated with a Cyclon XCT reagent. This background signal um, that is obtained must be subtracted from your test samples to obtain a true signal from your viable cells. Now, if we look at the reduction rate of the Cyclon XCT reagent when incubated on untreated spheroids, the blue line we also see an increase in absorbent signal. However, within 24 hours, 24 hours, we still 
do not see the signal plateau, indicating that it takes longer for the Cyclon XCP reagent to be reduced. One thing to keep in mind when studying 3D spheroids is that they are compact as opposed to a monolayer cells, which are very spread out. This is important because with this compact structure, it will take some time for the reagent to enter the center of the compact structure. As similarly to the drug-treated monolayer cells, the drug-treated spheroids presented um, presents a very low signal turn-on, confirming the absence of metabolically active cells, which is your yellow line. Now, although the signal from the cyclone XCP reagent continues to increase over time with the spheroids, the potency values are very similar. Here are we have a table with different incubation times with the cyclon XCT reagent and the IC60 values obtained at those incubation times. And you can see within this table, the IC50 values are within 30 to high 30 micromolar range, no matter at what time you take a reading with the cyclon XCT reagent. And because of this, the cyclon XCT cell viability assay can be used for both endpoint and kinetic assay mode. Now, only, now, not only can we quantify the cell viability of steroids and monolayers of cells, we can also visualize the health of the steroids by microscopy. These images were obtained on the EVOS M7000 imaging system on either a flat bottom 96 volt plate or on the monolayer cell four monolayer cells or a NUNC U-bottom 96 volt plate for the spheroids. From left to right, we have high concentrations of gambogic acid to low concentrations of gambogic acid. And from top to bottom, we have increasing incubation time with the drug, starting at two hours down to four or eight hours. So if we look at the top, at the two hours of the drug treatment, we can see a tight compact structure of these spheroids, like that of untreated spheroids which is associated with high cell viability. But as time progresses with the drug treatment, that compact structure is lost, which is seen in the 48-hour images with the high drug treatment at the bottom of this slide. As for the monolayer cells, the cells ball up and die at high concentrations of drug, which is different um, to the viable spreading of cells. So also keep in mind the structure of your 2D and 3D cellular models when you're looking at cell viability. So we talked about a photometric cell viability assay. Presto Blue HS now, though, is a fluorescent cell viability assay. Presto Blue HS, where HS stands for high sensitivity, is a new and improved viability assay. There are more than 50% reduction in the background and an increase in the signal to background ratio when compared to the original Presto Blue agent. Generally, when Presto Blue is used, it's used for a short time, uh, short incubation times. Um, Presto Blue HS is an add and read reagent that can be read in both absorbents and fluorescence. However, we highly recommend to use the fluorescence mode because of the higher sensitivity. Now, the main component within Presto Blue HS is resazurin, which gets reduced to fluorescent resorufin when in the presence of viable living cells. Because Presto Blue HS is a solution-based assay and the resorufin product gets released into the solution, a top reading is preferred for both monolayer and uh, both monolayer and spheroids of cells. Top reading is best for homogeneous solutions in this fluorescence mode, as mentioned by Adair earlier in this presentation. Here we have another drug dose response comparison of monolayer cells and spheroids. With this experiment, again, monolayer cells or spheroids were plated at 19 hours to allow the cells to adhere to the bottom of the well and to also allow for that tight, compact structure of spheroids to form. Both models were then treated with gambogic acid and the cell viability was assessed with Presto Blue HS at different hours of drug incubation time, which is two hours, 19 hours, or 48 hours. As shown within these graphs, as the incubation time increases, again, we see that the gambogic acid, um, the drug be 
the longer incubation times with gambogic acids, um, the drug becomes more potent. So additionally, when comparing spheroids and monolayers of cells, gambogic acid is less potent to spheroids than to monolayer cells. The results are very similar to what we saw earlier with a Cyclon XTT reagent. Here's a summary of the IC50 values obtained from the Presta Blue HS analysis with the drug treated monolayer or spheroid model. As I mentioned earlier, high concentrations of gambogic acid are required to kill the 19 hour spheroids when compared to monolayer cells or 2D cultures. Now, specifically with monolayer cells, there is a time dependent cytotoxic effect um, from gambogic acid. So the monolayer cells die off faster than your cells within your spheroid structure. We can also look at Presta Blue HS in kinetic mode. We can monitor the reduction rate of the cells with Presta Blue HS over time, which is shown in this graph on this slide. There is only one thing to remember when using Presta Blue HS in kinetic mode. Resorufin can always overreduce to non-fluorescent dihydroresorufin, which is why at about um, hour nine or 10 with this untreated monolayers of cells, the blue line in this graph, the fluorescent signal starts to decrease. If you incubate with Presta Blue HS too long, um, the dihydroresorufin will be produced and you can obtain a false negative. The yellow line is indicative of the absence of metabolically active cells for drug-treated monolayer cells. Similarly, with the Cyclone XTT reagent, incubating untreated spheroids, the blue line with Presta Blue HS, there is a slow increase in fluorescent signal over time. The reduction kinetics of Presta Blue HS on spheroids is slower than that on the monolayer cells, again, due to the, to the tight compact structure of cells. And as similarly to the drug-treated monolayer cells, the drug-treated spheroids present a very low signal turn-on, confirming the absence of metabolically active cells. So the Presta Blue HS assay can be used for both endpoint and kinetic studies. Cyclone Direct is another fluorescence assay that quantifies cellular proliferation, viability, and cellular cytotoxicity. There are two different components to the Cyclone Direct assay. There's a nucleic acid dye and a background suppressor. The nucleic acid dye is live cell permeable and concentrates to the nucleus of the cell, and the background suppressor is a cell impermeable reagent that suppresses the green background fluorescence. These two components work well together that there, there is no need for a wash step when using them, which makes this, an, this assay very simplified. Now, because the fluorescent signal accumulates within the nucleus of the cell, a bottom rate is best for these assays for both 2D and 3D cellular models. Using the Cyclant Direct assay to evaluate, evaluate cell viability, similar results are obtained as we saw earlier with the Cyclon XTT and Presta Blue HS. A similar experiment was done, as I mentioned before, a monolayer cells or spheroids were plated at 19 hours to allow the cells to adhere to the bottom of the well and your, your spheroid to form. Both models were then treated with gambogic acid and the cell viability in this case was then assessed with the Cyclon Direct reagent at different hours of drug incubation time. Again, two hours, 19 hours, and 48 hours. So as we saw previously with the other reagents, as incubation time increases with the gambogic acid, the drug becomes more potent. Additionally, when comparing spheroids on the right and monolayers on the left, gambogic acid is less potent to the cells than to the monolayer cells. Using Cyclant Direct as an endpoint assay, IC50 values were then obtained for the drug-treated monolayer or spheroid models. The cytotoxicity of gambogic acid on monolayers versus spheroids is consistent with the previous results from our XCT and Presto Blue HS assays. Now, because one of the components of the Cyclant Direct assay is a background suppressor that continues to enter the cell slowly over time, 
Cyclant Direct can only be used as an endpoint assay. As shown here with the untreated monolayer cells, the blue line, after about an hour of incubation with Cyclant Direct, the fluorescent signal starts to drop and continues to drop dramatically. Now, this drop in signal will provide a false negative. With drug treatment of monolayers of cells, this, there is no signal of, with drug treatment of monolayer cells, there is no, a little to no signal confirming the absence of DNA after replicating, um, from replicating cells. A similar decrease in fluorescent signal is seen with untreated spheroids, as shown in this graph with the blue line. Um, so we do prefer that the Cyclant Direct assay is um, used only as an endpoint mode for both 2D and 3D cellular models. We recommend this so that you avoid obtaining that false negative response. So far, we have been talking about plate reader, microplate reader assays, and although Cyclant Direct is a microplate read assay, one advantage of the Cyclant Direct assay is that it can be imaged as well, given that it is a nucleic acid dye and is most commonly used for high content imaging experiments. So here I show that similar results for cell viability using the Cyclant Direct can be collecting using either the VeriScan Lux microplate reader or the Cell Insight HCA instrument. The, on the left is the data collected on the VeriScan Lux microplate reader, and on the right is the data collected on the Cell Insight CX7 HCA platform. Because the HCA takes and half hour or even longer to collect data from a full 96 volt plate and the VeriScan Lux microplate reader only takes a couple of minutes for obtaining data on a full 96 volt plate. It would be most beneficial to use the microplate reader for initial screening before moving on to in-depth complex imaging experiments. So here I have a summary of the IC50 values obtained using Cyclant Direct as a cell viability assay on drug-treated monolayer or spheroid models. As I mentioned earlier, similar results and similar IC50 values are obtained on either the VeriScan Lux microplate reader or on the high-content CX7 HCA platform. So why use a time-consuming complex system like the HCA when you can use a simplified workflow on the VeriScan Lux microplate reader? The only advantage of using the high content CX7 platform is that you can visualize the structure of the spheroid. And when using the Cyclant Direct as a cell viability assay, your viable cells become highly fluorescent. Now, the top row of images here are phase contrasts, which allow you to visualize and see the compact structure of the spheroid. The bottom row images are the fluorescent channel for the cyclant direct reagent labeling viable cells. When these images, with these images, you can see how they pair with one another and how the tight core of the spheroid decreases from right to left as the drug concentration increases and the cell viability decreases. Additionally, the untreated and complex structure is labeled with a cyclant direct dye, meaning that those cells contain DNA and um, are cells that are replicating. Here's a summary table of all the reagents we talked about today in this webinar and their effect on 2D and 3D cellular model systems. Um, no matter what cell viability assay was used, similar IC50 values were obtained at the different drug incubation times, either two hours, 19 hours, or 48 hours. And across the board, we saw that as incubation time increases with gambogic acid, the drug becomes more potent. Additionally, when comparing your spheroids and monolayered cells, gambogic acid is less potent and spheroids to spheroids than to monolayer cells. Now I will hand off the presentation back to my colleague, Adiari. Uh, thank you, Leticia. Um, well, I really hope that uh, we have been able to uh, demonstrate uh, to you guys uh, the suitability of these three essays for 
these comparative studies between 2D and 3D, or even for just studying uh, or interrogating cellular health functions in, in 3D cells. Here you can see a summary of the uh, different uh, issues that were discussed by Leticia. We, we tried to cover all the possible um, measurements uh, in terms of uh, detection technology. So you had uh, photometric assays in, in the case of uh, Cyquant XTT, and then we had two fluorescent assays that can be read with top uh, or bottom reading, in the case of Presto Blue HS with top reading, and in the case of Cyquant Direct with bottom reading. All of the three essays, as uh, Leticia explained in detail, they can be used for uh, as endpoint measurements. But um, on, on the case of kinetic measurements, we recommend to use um, um, only Cyquant XPT and Presto Blue HS. Um, Cyquant Direct, we recommend to use only as endpoint measurements. They all are uh, having this kind of atom read format, so they require really minimal effort. Uh, during the workflow, and they have very similar incubation times uh, with the dyes. And uh, in the case of multiplexing compat uh, compatibility, then obviously uh, the, the fluorescent assays are superior. And if you are planning to to utilize different readouts and, and combine different endpoints, different cellular functions, interrogate different functions, then obviously utilizing uh, Presto Blue HS and Cyquan Direct, even the two of them together would be a, a better choice. Um, from the perspective of doing orthogonal research and combining these quantitative assays, uh, assays with uh, imaging, then uh, the best choice here is, is really Cyquan Direct. You, you saw the, the really spectacular images that you can obtain with Cyquan Direct and, and the benefits that then you can combine this quantitative data and correlate with the images that, uh, with the, these um, really nice um, phenotypic uh, images that can be obtained. So. We hope that you have um, hopefully um, learned a few essential issues that need to be taken into account when uh, utilizing these cell health essays uh, with microphase readers. Uh, for us, it's really important to convey the idea that we have a number of cell health microplay essays that even though they were originally developed for 2D cells models, they can be used for 3D 3D spheroids, and they really are a time and cost efficient approach to assess uh, therapeutic effects of uh, investigational compounds in early drug discovery. We have collected here some of the resources that are available for you uh, on our web pages. Um, we have recently published uh, an application note that covers a number of tips and tricks that uh, can be used for performing hydroboot fluorescent imaging and analysis of steroids. And that application note, I think we recommend it as a really good tool for to start and to know uh, how to approach this transition between 2D and 3D. In that application note, we have a list of uh, 12 uh, reagents or essays that we currently uh, have shown to be effective tools also in 3D using different detection platforms that you can see are listed here. So this hopefully will give you a quite good um, guideline and, and it will really um, help you navigate this transition between 2D and 3D and also it will help you perform in these comparison studies that we, we show you uh, today. So uh, we hope that you have been able to follow us through and that you have learned during this um, hour. Uh, now we have time for taking your questions and we really thank you for your attention and we'll be happy to answer uh, any questions and those that we cannot follow up then we'll be happy to follow up by email. Thank you. Thank you, Aniari and Leticia, for your informative presentations. We would love to understand your practices in this field. You will now see a survey pop up on your screen. We appreciate your participation. Okay, we will now move on to the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. All right, let's get started. Our first question is, can you comment on how luminescence measurements for 3D cells performed with plate readers? Uh, thanks, Michelle. 
Um, this is a quite interesting question. We haven't, we didn't have the time to to get into luminescence measurements, but um, generally speaking, luminescence measurements with plate readers are always performed from the top of the plate. So um, instruments try to collect all the light that is emitted in luminescence reactions. So there are really no no basic differences between um, collecting light in 2D versus 3D systems. So in that sense. Um, the show is, it's, um, has to do more with the essay than with the way in which the light is collected in microplate readers. Thank you. All right, next question. Can the cell viability reagents presented be used with 3D models grown in matrigel? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, we get that question very often. Uh, so uh, add and read solutions or add and read solution based assays such as like Presto Blue HS or Almar Blue HS and Cyquan XTT, which we presented here in the webinar. Um, they can be used for 3D models, but the incubation times will have to be optimized. So you generally have to incubate longer than you would with 3D structures not in major gel, um, but keep in mind such as assays such as Cyquan LDH, um, which is where you have to remove the solution from your cells into a brand new plate. Um, in this case, the LDH assay cannot be used for 3D models uh, surrounded by major gel just because of that removal of the media. Great. Thank you. Okay, next question. How can I make sure that the fluorescence or luminescence values that are measured with two different microplate readers are comparable? That's a great question. And this is a question that, that we get uh, asked very, very often. So uh, I think it's really important to remember that fluorescent and luminescent measurements are always relative measurements. So they are going to change from one microblade reader to the next one. What, um, when you, if you are changing between microblade readers and you want to make sure that you are getting the same performance from one microblade, microblade reader to the next one, you have to be able to always to measure the ratio between the signal and the background. So that ratio should remain uh, constant if you are comparing different microblade readers that have similar performance. So that is the one thing that you have to keep in mind. You cannot compare it directly between mic one microblade reader readout and another one. Sometimes scaling factors are used so that numbers are larger or numbers are smaller. So just bear in mind that the range between the signal and the background on your essay should remain the same if you are performing the same if you are reading the same plate uh, between different microprocessors with similar performance. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. How much is the steroid size a limiting factor for these assays? Um, that's another great question. Um, so the spheroid size um, is dependent on um, the type of plate that you use. You can have a, a, we recommend that you start with a low density plating all the way to a high density plating um, and determine at uh, what is the optimal size for your spheroid that you're actually using and, and how long of that drug incubation time to use but not only that, but also how long of the reagent to incubate with. Um, so it's not necessarily uh, a limiting, the limiting factor is um, how sensitive your reagent is. So it kind of goes back to your reagent um, and how sensitive um, it can detect a number of cells. Thank you. Next question, how do you measure background signal? Um, I can answer that. So background signal is always measured um, uh, on the media or on the buffer that you are actually performing your essay. And it should, of course, have the, the dye included on that, um, on that um, media or buffer. This is really important because, for example, if you are running essays on phenol red containing media, uh, phenol red is known to absorb light 
at um, very common excitation wavelengths. So um, this is something that you have to be aware of. And I didn't have time to get into that, but this is one reason as to why cell-based systems are actually um, often, monolayers are often measured from the bottom because then it can, you, can, you can exclude the effect of phenol red. But the way that you can establish the background level of this always um, with, the, with, the, with the solvent that you're using, media buffer, and then of course having the, the contribution of the dye in the absence of cells in this case. Thank you. What's the largest size of steroids that can be assayed? So this kind of goes back to the uh, question we had earlier of your reagent itself. And so the more cells that you have, um, the longer incubation time you're going to have your, with your reagent. But it also goes back to the size of plate. So we've ran um, spheroids um, as high as uh, 10,000 cells per well, but um, those were with, again, A549 cells or lung cancer cells. If you have a smaller cell type, such as MCF7, um, you can actually um, have more within your well. So you can have 20,000 uh, per well. So the size really is based off of your size of cells. Um, and then the reagent itself, again, you either have to have a longer incubation time um, for larger steroids, um, or you can shrink that incubation time if you go down to, um, say, 500 cells, so a, a smaller um, sample size. Any other questions, Michelle? It looks like we have time for one more question. If one is only studying 3D cells and not comparing with 2D models, is top fluorescence enough to quantify fluorescent signals on spheroids? Yeah, another really good question. Um, in the majority of the assays that we have tested, uh, top fluorescent is pretty sufficient to to um, to measure fluorescent signal on steroids on this model that we discussed during the webinar, but uh, but it it would need to be optimized and it would need to be compared. It's very very strongly dependent on the type of assay that you are uh, utilizing and the type of reagent, as as uh, Leticia has mentioned uh, several times. So it would need to be optimized. But yes, as a general rule, we would say that top um, top fluorescent. Uh, might be sufficient for a good, good, good portion of the essays out there. Thank you, Adiari and Leticia, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Any questions we did not have time for today and those, dur those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. Labyrinths will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.